here we are, episode 20 already of Merryweather's World. As usual, I am joined with my lovely daughter, Minnie Weather. She will be uh, answering the, or asking the questions that you all send in here tonight. So let's get into what you actually came for, and that is the presentation. <coughs> so I was counting, this is actually the ninth week of medicinal weeds and wildflowers of Texas. It's been going on a while. That's pretty cool. There's lots. We might actually finish tonight. Uh, it won't be every medicinal weed and wildflower in Texas. It'll just be all the ones that I've had slides made for, which is still uh, around 100. We've been going through a lot of information. And just a reminder, uh, with herbal medicine, these this is just an introductory uh, based on the scientific research I've found on these plants as to what sort of healing properties they have. Like I said, I have a master's in medicinal chemistry, a PhD in physical organic chemistry. I want to know the science that's going on. Rather than bore you with the science that's going on, though, I will just kind of give you a, an overview of what I found by searching all the scientific literature and studies done on these plants. As far as, yes, this plant does this, and there's a scientific study that proves it. So, good? All right, lots going on. So let me just jump here. Uh, just a, whoops, let me go back one. Just a, another reminder, you may have noticed we have no sponsor tonight. So we're just flying out of the kindness of our hearts. That being said, you can help support uh, Merriweather's World. If you shop at my Amazon store, the Amazon slash shop slash foraging Texas, there are multiple sections there. Uh, the one you might be interested most in is the herbal medicine books and herbal medicine making stuff. The things that I use in my day-to-day -day production of the different things I give to my family. Anything you purchase from this Amazon store, they will send me 6% of the purchase price. So for every dollar you spend, we get six cents. That adds up over time. So that is the Foraging Texas website, or the, the Amazon shop. So now let's jump into the plants, starting with Echinacea. Now, Echinacea, also known as purple cone flower, there's an, uh, several in this species, and luckily most of them have the medicinal properties. Before we go into the medicinal properties, there's something very important I want to say, and that is in the wild, this plant is disappearing. Due to its medicinal nature, it's being rustled left and right from the ditches and fields of Texas and Louisiana and pretty much everywhere it grows. And it's, so it's disappearing from the wild. Please, if you want this plant, purchase it, plant it somewhere in your garden, and just let it be. It will, it'll grow into a nice thick mass of flowers. And what sort of mass of flowers? Just this sort of thing. In case you were ever wondering what it's like to drive across the country with Merriweather, this is a pretty good picture of it. Note, uh, sorry, Kevin Fast, I am not actually pooping in a ditch here. This is me stopping in the middle of nowhere to get a bunch of pictures of this wonderful stand of echinacea I found. So this is what my family has to put up with every time they're driving with me anywhere. Medicinal properties of the echinacea. This is one a lot of people are familiar with, at least that it does something. So let's talk about what scientists have found it actually does for the human body. Uh, when we are dealing with this plant medicinally, we can use pretty much the entire plant, the root, the stem, the leaves, the flower. The highest percentage of the medicinal properties are in the root. The root by itself is probably 80% of the power of the plant, eh, more like 70, but it's still a huge part of it. That means that you kill the plant when you harvest the root to make medicine, which is one of the main reasons I want you to grow it yourself rather than ripping it out of the ground willy-nilly in the ditches and roadways of the south. So the roots, leaves, and flowers, a number of things it does. First, the most powerful effect is it is an immune system stimulant. Uh, I would put it very close to elderberry. Elderberry is still a little bit better, uh, especially on an overall fast-acting 
sort of of effect the echinacea it's very powerful um, but it, it, it's a little slower build if you will so uh, just a general immune stimulant to help you fight any sort of diseases going on both bacterial and viral so I'm a uh, I'm thinking it, it goes uh, activates the white T cells uh, like the elderberry does and so it can basically eat the bad invaders in your body it is anti-inflammatory so if you're dealing with uh, swellings issues sort of things it will help with that um, important side note the effect uh, even the swelling and so forth if you are suffering from lupus or uh, some other autoimmune sort of swelling sort of things, then echinacea is not something you want. The last thing you want to do in that case is activate your immune system to be even more aggressive in attacking stuff. Uh, because in a lot of those autoimmune type diseases, what the immune system is attacking is you. So colds, flus, that sort of thing, not chronic long-term illnesses, especially autoimmune illnesses. Uh, mentioned antibacterial, antiviral. It is a wound healer. It will stimulate the healing of wounds. If you use it as a poultice or a wash on a wound, it, it basically tells the healing factors in your body, this healing thing you're doing, do more of it and do it more quickly. So that's always good. It is a very mild anesthetic. Uh, again, as a poultice sort of thing, Overall, I would say willpower might be just as good, um, but there are studies that show it does have some minor uh, anesthetic sort of effects, sort of pain-killing effects. Maybe uh, as a tincture, you know, throw it in some vodka, that might work better. So the main ways of using these plants, or this plant, the parts of this plant, again, is the tincture, the tisane, aka herbal tea, or as a poultice where you just mash up the plant and put it on the affected areas. Where or when you find this is spring and summer. And where you find it is open fields and roadways and ditches and kind of disturbed areas. It seems to like ditches uh, because of the water that, that kind of pools in the ditches. So it does require some water, but it, it really does well in just about full sun. Uh, other side note, because of the particular family the echinacea belongs to, it's a very extensive family, there's a, a pretty good record of people who have been using it for a while actually developing an allergy to it just because similar plant family members are all over and uh, basically people just uh, develop an allergy to it. So it's really for short-term use, you know, just to help stimulate the immune system to fight a current disease, but not used for long chronic illnesses. All right, any questions? I'm assuming there are. There are a couple. So does echinacea have the same problems with autoimmune issues as elderberry does? Whoops, let me go this. Yeah, so the when you stimulate the immune system, when you basically cause the human body to produce more aggressive white blood killer T type cells. If you are uh, suffering from an autoimmune disease, all you're gonna do is increase the attacks on your body. So in the case of, again, lupus is one of the, the big ones. Uh, it can cause problems there. So you do not want to take echinacea. You do not want to take elderberry when you are a lupus sufferer because it can actually lead to a greater damage from the lupus illness. Okay. And then what sort of dosage for echinacea? Okay, so going, oops, I always go to the presentation. So the, the echinacea, uh, for this, usually you're going to want a lot of it. So make a quart at a time. Take the dried plant material, so the dried root, the dried flowers, the dried leaves, crush them all up, chop them up really well. And for each quart, put in a good two tablespoons of herb and just let them steep. So bring the water to the boil and then pull it off the heat, dump in the herb, cover the pot, let it soak for 10 to 30 minutes. 
and strain it out and then drink it. So a quart at a time with two tablespoons of the plant in there and see how that does. I wouldn't do more than a quart every six hours, um, but that will be a good starting point and see how your body kind of reacts to it. No other questions. No so other questions. So echinacea, really easy to grow, really worth having in your medicinal garden. Plant lots of it because, like I said, the most potent part is the root. So and to get the root, you have to kill the plant. All right. Next up is horsetails. I love horsetails um, just because they are tact tactically uh, really pleasing. These things are incredibly primitive plants. If you're out along stream banks and so forth, they look like this weird short bamboo that maybe is getting two and a half, three feet tall, but usually it's a lot shorter. And at each one of these joints, you can see here, the light colored areas, it pops apart really nicely. It's a very rough plant. The stem, and really all it is, is stem is filled with the silicate material so basically sand in boy scouts we call this the pot scrubber reed even though technically it's not a reed but this you find it along wet areas in texas and it is a very potent wound healer uh, think of this as almost like yarrow if you're familiar with yarrow the horsetail first off the crushed up stems into a poultice is a hemostat which just a fancy way of saying it stops bleeding. So if you have a wound that's bleeding, some crushed up, mashed up horsetail applied to it will definitely help cause the bleeding to stop. It is a wound healer. We mentioned that with echinacea where uh, it basically tells the human body this whole wound healing thing you're doing, do more of it and do it more quickly. So it's really good for there, especially deep cuts uh, sort of thing. It, it really does stimulate and speed up the healing process. The tea or tisane made from it is a diuretic, so it will uh, you know, cause you to pee. So you want to drink a lot of it just because you'll be peeing it all out. And that's always good. The, this is going to sound, you know, whatever, but really the, the more clear and copious your pee is, probably the healthier you are. Now, one of its main properties, though, is it assists in the rebuilding of damaged uh, connective tissue. So ligaments, tendons, bones, uh, even muscles, some. It has, it's loaded that those silicates that I mentioned are a key uh, component needed by the human body to build, especially the tendons and the ligaments. So if you have a bad sprain or strain or uh, tear in that, a poultice or the tea of the horsetail will help uh, flood the body with what the body needs to rebuild this damage. That being said, in the uh, chronic long-term, like arthritis sort of damage, it does not breaking down more quickly than the horsetail. It's a, the, the damage being done by the arthritis isn't the same sort of damage that is fixed by the horsetail. So again, in the, in the realm of especially arthritis or other chronic uh, issues where your connective tissues are, are uh, degenerating, the horsetail does not help there. Uh, used as a poultice or a tincture or a tisane, I like making a tea out. It has the best way I can describe the flavor. It's kind of like goldenrod. And if you know me talking about goldenrod, goldenrod to me tastes kind of like black licorice. And remember, the, every one of you has different taste buds and you may focus in on a particular molecule different than others in a particular plant. And so in my case, when I'm drinking a tea made with the horsetails, I'm picking up the black licorice flavor. But depending on what highly active taste buds you have, you might notice a different flavor. Now, one key thing about horsetails is if you are taking it internally, so as a tea or a tincture, you really need to cook, uh, usually just by boiling the horsetails for a good 10 or 15 minutes. The reason you need to do this is the horsetails have a uh, compound in them called a thymonase, 
which basically if you do not destroy that particular protein, once it gets in your body, it will interfere with your body's ability to uh, take in and process vitamin B, B as in boy. So you do need to boil the, uh, the horsetails for a while, 10 to 15 minutes, to get rid of that enzyme that wants to destroy the vitamin B in your body. Once it's been boiled, you're good to go. So really good stuff. Like I said, I drink this uh, just as a, I like the flavor sort of thing. Uh, but again, you can use it medicinally as a poultice on wounds, as a wash, or drinking it. Any questions? We got a question. Okay. Could a poultice from horsetail help with sore muscles from workouts? I would say yes. Uh, years ago, <laughs> I, I, I get to talk science here for a minute. Years ago, back in South Dakota State University, I actually took a class in weightlifting. And it was really fascinating because it went a lot into the, the physiology and biology of what's happening when you're lifting weights. And that muscle pain you feel, the initial pain, it's lactic acid buildup. But the hours later, that pain you're feeling, that is due to all sorts of little tears in the connective tissue of your muscles. And it's the process of healing those tears and making that connective tissue tougher is a large deal or a large part of the increased strength. So yes, the horsetail uh, tea should help give the body the stuff it needs to rebuild that tissue. Also keep in mind vitamin C. One of the key, com or key uses of vitamin C is to help you know, tissue connect to other tissue. So a dose of vitamin C along with the horsetails would be a really good, theoretically a really good uh, after workout sort of addition to your, your rehydration process. It would be giving the body the chemicals it needs to you know, repair the damage done, the little micro tears done by the weightlifting. And in a way that toughens them up, increasing your strength. So I don't know if the overall, if it will make you add to the amount you can lift, but the should speed up your recovery some from the lifting. Okay, anything else? If you don't boil it long enough, how long does it interfere with vitamin B absorption? Ooh, good question. I'm not sure. I would say until it is excreted from the body, and that could be several days depending on the compound. Um, thankfully, it is a diuretic, so if you're drinking a lot of water, you will help flush things out. But I would say, and this is just kind of grabbing lots of information from other places and throwing it at this, I would say probably three days just from what I've seen on the biological breakdown of, of similar proteins and so forth. It could be longer, it could be less, I don't know. I'm making what I call a scientific wild ass guess though, but around three days is what I've seen uh, tossed out there for breaking down similar proteins in the body. Anything else? Last one is, does it help with IBS? Ooh, irritable bowel syndrome. I don't know. I do not know enough about the cause of IBS. Uh, for that, we did talk about a plant last week, though. Uh, horse, horseweed. Yeah, horseweed. Uh, or maybe, no, we're talking, hey, hang on. I think we're talking about that one this week. In fact, I think it's the next one. It's like a, you're, you're reading ahead here. So let's move to the next one. Uh, any, oh, one more. She says she will be planting these, and what is the best place to find seeds? Like, okay, know? the horsetails, I'll tell you right now, the Arbor Gate Nursery in Tomball has them for sale. It's fairly common at a lot of different nurseries. Getting the seed, if you look closely, hopefully you're, you're on the computer here where you can see on the rightmost uh, head, those little dots there, those are the seeds uh, that you would want to plant. It likes uh, sandy, loose soil, 
that is wet or near wet a lot. It's, it's, it's kind of a water loving plant. It doesn't want to be right in the water, but it loves growing along sandy stream banks, uh, like along Spring Creek and Oyster Creek and things like that. There are big stands of it. It likes being right up next to the water. So if you have a wet area in your yard, that would probably be the key place. Also, uh, it seems to prefer shade more than full sun. So if you're going to plant it, uh, find a shady, moist area in your yard, and that's where you're going to have the best luck. Anything else? No more questions so far. All right, moving on. Horseweed. And horseweed is just starting to pop up. Uh, if you aren't very attentive to plants, it looks a lot like young goldenrod. Uh, the main differences are the leaves are a slightly lighter green, have more teeth, but the real key is the stem is very hairy. The goldenrod stem is smooth, whereas the horseweed is very hairy. Uh, here on the left-hand picture, that is just a young one. That's what it's looking like right about now in the Houston area. Uh, if you're farther north, it'll be a little smaller. If you're farther south, it'll be a bit bigger. This thing actually turns into a pretty tall plant. It can be you know, six feet or more tall, but it has a hairy stem. And if you can see these leaves, the leaves are alternating on the stem, kind of zigzagging up the stem. So look for this and then, yes, okay. Uh, this is a younger one again. This is probably what it's gonna look like in April. But the leaves and the stem of Horthwaite are a good soother of chronic gastrointestinal inflammations, uh, including helping soothe colitis sort of things and reducing leaky gut syndrome. So there's been some good scientific research done on this that uh, taken as a tea or a, a tincture, uh, it will help with a lot of the digestive tract issues. Uh, basically helping it, uh, especially irritations, kind of soothe the irritations there. So that would probably be the one uh, that would be good. It also works for internal bleeding. Uh, so basically kind of helps. I won't say it works like Pepto-Bismol, but if you remember the Pepto-Bismol uh, commercials where it soothes it or it coats it, soothes sort of thing. The horse, uh, horse weed kind of works more at the nerve level in the stomach and the GI tract and basically just kind of sedating it some. So anti-diarrheal, uh, keep in mind that if by anti-diarrheal, it can actually lead to constipation. <laughs> so uh, keep that in mind. You want to increase your fiber or things like that. I know. Or your spider wart. Or your spider wart. I knew that someone's going to bring it up. I didn't expect it to be my daughter, but I guess she is my daughter. So it makes sense that she would bring it up. And those of you who weren't here a couple of weeks ago, we got into the great discussion of the laxative effects of spider wart. Uh, so a combination of spider wart with horseweed might be a good thing to try. But really any sort of irritations with the gut. In the case of irritations, I would move away from the tinctures just because alcohol can be, you know, a drying agent, an inflaming agent. It can cause irritation. So uh, most cases, uh, tisane will work, uh, but the compounds that you're after are alcohol soluble. So the vodka works too. Uh, you know, what? actually what might be a good one is using the vodka to extract it and then converting the vodka tincture into a glycerol or glycerin tincture where you go to the drugstore, get some glycerin, pour your alcohol tincture into it, heat it up, drive off the alcohol and transfer everything into the glycerin and then use that because that's going to be alcohol free. The downside of the glycerin tinctures is they are not very shelf stable. Uh, it's a uh, few weeks maybe if you keep it in the really cold part of your refrigerator but you have to be careful with that but the uh, if you want the powers of tinctures but not the alcohol the most common way is with a, a, a glycerin transfer this is uh, just starting to show up now so late winter spring and it'll grow into about mid-july by mid-july 
towards the end of July. It's really going to go to uh, flower then. The flowers pop up pretty quickly and then go to seed. At that point, the leaves are starting to shut down. They're not really making all the medicinal chemicals. They're just focusing on getting the seeds ready to be spread out and dispersed and growing. So really now until early June, mid-June would be really when you want to collect this. And I'm not sure on this one, uh, but on goldenrod, if you snip just the top like three layers of leaves, the goldenrod will, will send out you know, multiple new shoots and keep growing. I'm not sure if horseweed will do that. Uh, normally, I just collect the whole thing because um, it's, it's very prevalent around here where I am and where I'm allowed to harvest. So horseweed, this is a, a alternating tooth leaves on a very hairy stem and grows into a very tall plant. You'll find it in disturbed areas and ditches and fields. It generally seems to like sun, uh, especially being a kind of a springtime plant. Uh, the sun isn't going to be baking it to death yet, so it's going to grow a lot uh, pretty quickly in the in the spring. Any questions? Is there um, any general horseweed dosage that you recommend? Okay, like with most things, uh, the horseweed, uh, for what you're doing, go with a quart and the two tablespoons of the dried plant material uh, steeped in the hot water, not boiled. So you bring the water to boil, take it off the stove, let it cool a few minutes, then put the, the dried plant material in there. Let it steep for 10 to 30 minutes, strain out the plant, drink the tea. Uh, quick word, a lot of you have already heard me talk about this, but for those who are new to Meriwether's world and the idea of herbal teas or herbal tisanes, it's important to let the plant dry for about two weeks before you use it. And you want it to dry naturally, just hanging up you know, somewhere in your house out of the sunlight rather than putting it in a dehydrator or otherwise forcing it to dry. If you remember your high school biology, plants have a cell wall. It's a hard, rigid structure that keeps everything inside the cell inside and everything outside outside. So if you just take these leaves and drop them in hot water, nothing can get out. You'll just have a, a you'll get a little bit out, but not much. If you uh, let it dry though for two weeks, the last thing that occurs when a plant realizes it's dead is it triggers a series of enzymes whose purpose is to start breaking holes through that cell wall. This is a, a part of the rotting process to help return all the nutrients that it's collected over its life back to the soil, back to its, its baby plants, its siblings around there, so they can have access to that nutrients rather than keeping it permanently locked up in that cell wall. If you've ever frozen green beans, the blanching step where you stick the green beans in boiling water for a minute and then cool them down and freeze them, that's what you're doing. You're screwing up that enzyme whose purpose is to break holes through that cell wall. But over the course of a week, this enzyme will chew holes in the cell wall. So now you'll have you know, holes in the cell wall. The water can evaporate away naturally. So after two weeks, uh, all the water has been lost. The enzyme will stop working and the plant won't continue to deteriorate. It'll just kind of be stuck at the state it's in. So after two weeks, put it in a, a, a nice airtight jar, keep it out of the sun, and then use that. Two tablespoons per quart of hot water to make your medicinal tea or tisane. Any other questions? What are your thoughts on using DMSO in tinctures to help with absorption? Okay, I'm actually a semi-fan of DMSO. Uh, if you're not familiar with dimethyl sulfoxide, it has this interesting property of being quickly absorbed through the skin and taking whatever else is dissolved in it with it. Uh, it was very common in the 80s. Uh, people would, uh, especially marathon runners is where I first learned of it, uh, people would crush up aspirin into DMSO and rub it directly on the sore, you know, the knees, the hips, uh, places like that to, to you know, basically throw the aspirin right into the point of inflammation and pain. So it works well for that. You want to make sure what you are buying is a very high purity type material. Um, you know, get it from Aldrich or something like that. The key to remember though with, with the DMSO is what 
whatever chemicals it absorbs, it's going to take into your skin with it. So you want to make sure you are very clean, no gasoline or oil or, you know, other potential you know, pesticides, things like that. You know, you want to make sure you're, you're clean and showered and fresh and nothing else is coming in contact with the DMSO. Uh, my dad, he suffers, from, well, he caught polio when he was three and his right leg is just a stick. It's about this big around. Um, but one of the side effects of the polio is pain throughout his body and the only ointment liniment type product that he's found that really works is one that's high in DMSO and just seeing the relief it gives him I'm very thankful for the power of DMSO as far as taking things in but remember the the key is to make sure you're only putting in what you want in the case of the horseweed or some of the other plant actually well I wouldn't use it for horseweed because uh, you know it's better to take it as a tincture but some of the other uh, materials it would work well with okay anything else does air drying also apply to roots and mushrooms or just leaves all plants roots mushrooms bark all those things in the case of roots because the roots are so big and thick uh, one thing you can do is cut them into long strips and let them hang uh, or you know just let the whole thing hang a long time uh, don't remember yeah I talked about uh, curly dock the curly dock root it's this big huge thick yellow root and it needs to dry at least a year intact so you don't cut the curled dock curly dock root up you let it dry intact in the case of the curly dock and iris is another one of them the blue iris of Louisiana iris the root is very medicinal but you need to let them dry for over a year in the case of the blue iris, you want to let it go for uh, like three or four years. And what's going on in the roots is there's still a lot of chemistry going on in the cells, even after the root is out of the ground. But eventually the plant goes, oh, okay, something happened. I'm, I'm dead. I'm not getting my photosynthesis. And it triggers a number of enzymes who start breaking apart the components in the root and rebuilding them into different molecules that have medicinal properties. Um, but the root itself, because it's so thick, it really needs to dry for a long time. I would say any sort of root, let it dry two months, three months, and then go from there. Uh, mushrooms, same sort of thing. The harder, like a reishi mushroom. Uh, with the reishi mushroom, it's actually worth chopping up really quickly while it's still soft. And then starting making your medicinal you know, tincture. Uh, from it or your double extraction but otherwise yeah just let it dry for multiple weeks the mushrooms don't have quite the same enzymes whose purpose is to break down the cell walls because mushrooms aren't plants they do not have a cell wall their uh, connective chemistry or their skin their their tissue it's uh, a lot of sugar based molecules so kind of starch sort of things not exactly water soluble, but not as problematic to get through as the plant material. With the plants, with the true plants, a big part of the drying is to break apart the cell wall. With mushrooms, the drying is more just to make a stable, non spoiling sort of you know, thing you can store in a bottle for, for later use. Anything else? I was working with DSMO in the lab and it had huge cancer warnings on the bottle. Is that no longer true? Uh, it's, I don't want to say this, lawyers. There are some issues. It's more what is it dragging in with it. The DMSO um, by itself in small doses, uh, when you're rubbing it on the skin, it would be you know, half a teaspoon at most, and just when you need it. Um, my dad's been taking it for 20 years, rubbing it on his back and on his, his legs, and no cancer. Um, so it boils down to if you are genetically susceptible to cancer, 
it may cause cancer. If you're not genetically susceptible to cancer, I have a feeling the increased risk is minor. Uh, but like anything else, you don't want to bathe in this stuff. You just want to use, you know, just a, a little dab will do you really to to get the the stuff in. So, but yeah, a lot of it just comes down to lawyers too. So, anything else? Nothing else. All right. So we've what well, we've covered three plants so far tonight. Not bad. Moving on to the next wood sorrel. Now, most people think of wood sorrel as that tangy, lemony, wonderful, sort of shamrocky uh, thing they think is clover, but it's not a clover. It is an oxalis species. Uh, it has the little heart-shaped leaves. You can see that heart-shaped, as opposed to clover having the more round or even kind of football-shaped. But as far as medicinal goes, it's not a super strong medicinal plant. Uh, it is a diuretic like so many others. The oxalic acid will help kind of flush out the thing. That being said, the flavor is due to the chemical oxalic acid, so you don't want to eat a lot of it. If you are looking for a diuretic, there are much better plants to eat. Uh, it is a minor fever reducer. I would put willow well above it. Um, the main thing with the wood sorrel is... Not so much a fever reducer, though it does have that power, granted. But uh, eating it while you're out and about, when you're overheating, as long as you are drinking a lot of water, it will help f speed up the cooling process some. So it'll help you feel uh, more coolly. It'll help cause the body's thermal, thermal regulator to kind of kind of calm down some. Now that being said, if you're you know on the edge of heat stroke. Uh, your body is trying to dump heat, and one of the ways it's dumping heat is by running all the, the uh, blood to the surface. That's why you're all flushed and red, and you're sweating profusely. Actually, with heat stroke, you've already stopped sweating. Uh, long story short, don't take wood sorrel when you are feeling like you're getting heat stroke or heat exhaustion. It's something you want to have earlier in the day as a little bit of a nibble with what you're doing. It will help you feel uh, more cool. Another good use for it is uh, to help with indigestion, uh, bloating and so forth. Uh, just eating it um, helps trigger some of the digestive acids and helps break down the foods and break down the bloating compounds. Uh, helps you with a general indigestion sort of thing. Helps you feel good. So that might be uh, you know, something to think about if you have a big feast coming up. One of the things I like to do with wood sorrel is whip it into butter to make kind of a tangy, lemony butter. So maybe using a tangy, lemony butter during your big feast might be a way of incorporating the wood sorrel into your diet there to help, again, with the, the indigestion. So I mentioned the oxalic acid. The issue with large amounts of oxalic acid is it likes to react with the calcium in your blood and then precipitate out in an insoluble calcium oxalate in your uh, kidneys, which are crystals that look more or less like sea urchins. So if you are susceptible to kidney stones, you probably want to avoid the wood sorrel. And when you are eating it, make sure you have lots of water going with it. And in addition, if uh, you can have some slightly acidic water, like a cranberry or even some lemon water, lemon juicy sort of water, that will help. Uh, it will help reduce the chances of kidney stones. But like I said, especially if you are susceptible to kidney, kidney stones, you probably want to avoid it. Also, because of its calcium grabbing uh, properties, if you suffer from osteoporosis, and I know I'm butchering that word, but osteoporosis, uh, where you're just not getting enough calcium into your bones, that's another case where you probably want to avoid the wood sorrel. But as far as uh, indigestion, minor fever re uh, lever, it's a pretty good plant. Any questions? Thus far, no. No. All right. Moving on to the next, then. <coughs> Excuse me. Is yarrow. Uh, those of you who know the Greek history. Yeah, Greek. Achilles. Achilles was Greek, right? I believe so. Okay. She's the mythological expert. Uh 
Yeah, so the Yaro, this was one of the key factors in, in the, the Greek army's ability to conquer things, and Roman too, actually. Uh, the Yaro is a very potent healing herb. So the flowers, the leaves, and the root of the Yaro, they have a number of properties. Uh, probably the, the least impressive is just anti-diarrhea. So if you have some sort of dysentery sort of thing going on, which is a common problem with armies invading places and getting bad water. Uh, I mean, if you're out due to dysentery, that can really weaken your military force. So yarrow was used for that. Uh, it's a good blood stopper, both internally and externally. So if you had a, you know, say a spear through your, your chest, or you know, bad slash on your arm, or something like that. Uh, for the external worm, external wounds, they would pack the wounds with the dried up crushed flowers or the fresh flowers if they had them. In both cases, the main thing is to crush the flowers up and pack the wound with it to to uh, stop the bleeding. It's also antibacterial, so it'll help uh, keep any infections from forming. And it is a wound healer. It does that whole telling the body this thing you're doing to heal, do more of it and do it more quickly. So it's really good for use in wounds. It is a thermal regulator. So kind of like the wood sorrel we mentioned, it helps uh, maintain your body at the right temperature depending on what's going on. Now, in the case of sicknesses, I believe fevers should be allowed to run their course because the whole purpose of the fever is to raise the body's temperature up above what is good for the invading bacteria. But the yarrow, just kind of as a side effect, um, the antimicrobial, antibacterial, and wound healing properties outweigh the fever-reducing properties of it. And so even if you have a bad cold, bad infection, yarrow is worth taking. It's very, very, very potent. Uh, it is a mucosal assist. So, you know, when you get that lung cheese from a really bad cold or congestion where everything's just draining and congealing in your lungs, the yarrow as a, as a tea or a tisane, uh, especially as a hot one, will help break that up and help you have more productive coughs. You can cough that lung cheese out. Uh, bruises, sprains, strains. The poultice of the yarrow was used to, to help with that. It will help uh, reduce the swelling and the pain associated with the bruises, help the blood, uh, you know, that sort of bruises. It's just a bunch of blood pooled under the skin. It helps break that up and send it back into the body, uh, thereby relieving the pain, relieving the ugly bruise, relieving the swelling. So in this case, a poultice, mash up the plant, put it on there, and just let it do its magic. So reduce the swelling, sprain, strains, things like that. Really, really, really useful plant. This should be in large quantities in your garden right next to the echinacea uh, to help you build a really good herbal garden. Uh, if you were only going to have one herbal plant, I would go with yarrow. That is probably the overall the most effective from the day-to-day injuries and occurrences that people encounter. So taking it as a tincture, as a tisane, as a poultice, any of those work. Uh, side note, before hops were found, yarrow was one of the key components in bittering beer. It was added to the beer for its antimicrobial properties to help uh, keep the, the, the beer from going bad because it would you know, once the alcohol content is up around 4 or 5%, yeah, most things won't grow in it. Uh, but occasionally you can still get things in there. So the yarrow was put just to help stabilize the beard uh, and also as a bittering agent. It's showing up right now, especially up in the hill country. I was up at Vista Brewing last week up in Driftwood, or two weeks ago, up in uh, Driftwood, Texas, and the yarrow leaves were eh, maybe two inches long, just popping up. Wonderful, frilly, soft-looking things. But uh, this is a, a very aggressively growing plant. If you plant it in your garden and you have any sort of decent soil, uh, loose soil, and give it enough water, it will spread and kind of take over. A lot of people don't like it for that reason. Think of it as kind of a mint it's not in the mint family, but it can grow aggressively like a mint. So hopefully you have a good big spot to put it. 
Um, it does like partial shade, not full sun. Usually I'll find it growing under solitary trees that shade it, say, in the late afternoon, but it can get the morning sun. So really, 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 really good plant. Any questions? Surprisingly, not right now. No questions. Wow. Okay. Well, I think... Oh, oh we do have one more. Oh, wait. Uh, Whoop. We got one. We got a question. Yay, question. I get excited by questions. Does it grow wild in Oregon? Does it grow wild in Oregon? I have no idea. Um, I've never been up there. Wait. We can find oh, out. Ha, ha, ha. So if you go <laughs> to the Foraging Texas website, www.foragingtexas, and scroll all the way to the bottom... What I'm trying to show is at the Foraging Texas website, uh, every plant has a Texas map where it shows the different counties that the USDA has found the plant. And why are you not? Oh, okay. So it has both a Texas plant, a uh, Texas map, and a North American map. But we have to just get to said map. I have way too much going on in my computer. Um, I really need a more powerful computer. Okay, looking at the USD map of where Yarrow is found, I would say yes, it is found in Oregon. It appears to be found in every state and province in North America. So, pretty awesome. Okay, another question. Oh, we got two more questions. <laughs> okay. The first one is, do the various ornamental colored varieties have these medicinal qualities, or is it only the white ones? Oh, go with any of them. They all have the same medicinal properties. Uh, that's one of the nice things about the yarrow, is you can get a, a variety of colors, but they're all going to be equally good uh, from a medicinal point of view. Okay. And was there another? The other question was along the same line, just asking if the red and yellow varieties decrease in potency. Yeah, no, it's, it's all good. It's all yarrow. It's all going to work the same. All right, we are at 856. Um, you know what? Let's just jump to the last plant. I really don't have any words of wisdom tonight, but... Uh, after we talk about the Spanish moss, we'll, we might go a little over here. Hopefully there's nothing on TV at 9 o'clock that you want to see. But Spanish moss and ball moss, these are both uh, aerophytes. They are not parasites. They are not sucking anything from the tree. They are just taking stuff from the air. But the Spanish moss is the long, drapey, kind of spooky-looking stuff that hangs from trees. And the ball moss are these round tribble, you know, Star Trek tribble-looking things that cluster on trees. And they are both a bacteria stats. So a bacteria stat is not a bacteria side. It does not kill bacteria. Uh, what it does is prevent the bacteria that remains from reproducing. So after you've killed the bacteria in a wound or your body uh, with some other plant, uh, then especially in a wound, the, it would pack the wound with the Spanish moss or the ball moss crushed up. You need to rupture the plant cells some. Uh, but in this case, taking the, the, the well, gray moss, but the fresh moss and just mashing it up really well uh, is good enough. You don't have to let it dry for two weeks or anything like that. Uh, you can, um, but I find at that point when you mash it up, it gets a little powdery. And that can be a little problematic getting out of the wound. So fresh Spanish moss, fresh ball, fresh ball moss, pounded, ruptured, crushed, but not powdered. So bacteria stat. The other interesting thing is they've shown that it reduces the risk of prostate cancer in men. If you're familiar with the saw palmetto, uh, saw palmetto is recommended to help uh, maintain proper prostate size to prevent the swelling of the prostate, which can lead to prostate cancer. Uh, the Spanish moss and the ball moss, it's a different chemical. It's not the same chemical that's found in uh, saw palmetto, but studies have shown it actually has the properties of reducing the risk of, of prostate cancer, which is awesome. Another thing it does is it controls the transfer of sugar from your stomach, from your digestive system into your blood. 
So for our diabetics in particular, uh, including the Spanish moss and the diets, uh, usually as a tincture, uh, probably not a tisane because tisane, or sorry, as a tisane, as the tea, not the tincture, because uh, in the case of a lot of diabetics, the basically the, the sugar rush you would get from the alcohol too could be problematic. So in that case, you want to do the tisane or the tea uh, for the Spanish moss and the ball moss. But to externally, to prevent bacteria from reproducing, and then taken internally, males, to prevent or reduce the chance of prostate cancer, and for diabetics to help slow down the transfer of sugar from the, the intestines, from the, the guts to the, the blood. And that, wow. So that covers nine weeks of medicinal uh, weeds and wildflowers. Uh, way back in October, we talked about uh, medicinal trees and bushes, and now we cover the weeds and wildflowers. Uh, also, there was medicinal landscaping sort of thing. So we've been talking a lot about medicine. I think we're going to move back into edible plants next week, uh, thinking it'll probably be an introduction to aquatic edible plants. Uh, at this point, do we have any other questions? We actually got quite the flood. Oh boy! <laughs> All right, let's. So, um, you know, what? let's just keep going. What the okay. hell? <laughs> what would be the best technique to treat soreness from a workout? For example, yarrow tea, tincture, or poultice. Okay, uh, I would go with the, the uh, tisane, the tea. A uh, big reason for that is just to ensure proper hydration. I mean, the, the hydration is always really, really important, especially after a workout. You don't want to be taking alcohol, um, especially with, with vitamin C and the horsetail type stuff, the, the silicates to help rebuild the tissue. By far, the tisane, the tea, would be the best way of doing it. Throw some willow bark in there too, just to help with any pain, and you're kind of good to go. What else do we have? Right. Does ball moss grow on oak trees? Yes, ball moss is very common on oak trees. Let me just go back one. Uh, in fact, that's usually one where I see I see it more on oak trees than pretty much anything else. I'll see it on hackberry. Uh, occasionally, I see it on some of the maples, but the oak it really seems to like the oaks. Uh, side note, especially in the case of the ball moss, a little less than the Spanish moss, but with the ball moss, it's a really good indicator of air quality. Like we said, the ball moss and the Spanish, Spanish moss both uh, take all their water and nutrients and stuff directly from the air. And in the case of ball moss in particular, if there's any toxins or poisons in the air, it doesn't grow. So if you're wondering about the air quality of some place and you see lots of ball moss, that's a sign that it's really good air. All right, last one. Turkey tail preparation. Oh boy. Okay. <laughs> so for turkey tail preparation, I recommend going to Foraging Texas and look up the double extraction under Rishi and do the same thing. So treat the turkey tail as you would a Rishi mushroom uh, and just do the double extraction because you want to get the alcohol soluble components and the water soluble components. Where is turkey tail? Yeah. And I don't think I have the instructions for the double extraction on the turkey tail there. But anyway, okay, at this point, I heard the garage door open. My wife is going to be coming in soon, and she never wants to be on. So I need to start shutting this down. So Any thank words you. of wisdom? I have no words of wisdom. I I got a few that I'm I'm trying to find the white the right way of saying um sometimes the way it is in my head may not be quite the best way of saying it so maybe next week we'll we'll get back to some words of wisdom but right. other than that 
Good night, everyone. Good we night. will see you next week. Same plant time, same plant channel.